welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces back um, for another week of Superior Health Quality Alliance Roundtable Conversation. Uh, my name is Kelsey Ostergren, and I am joined by my co-leads for this project, Kim Heff and Jerry Hineker. Um, and as you know, I'm sure you've been joining these calls week after week, but this really is part of our ongoing education sessions um, that we're offering related to COVID-19. Um, so just a few announcements before uh, we get started for today. Um, so first, do you have a story to share? We are looking for resident stories about their decision to get the COVID-19 booster. Um, and really what we're hoping to do with these are create some really short vignettes um, to use and disseminate across the region to encourage other residents to get vaccinated, um, staff as well, and just really use these as a promotional opportunity and would love it if you have either staff or residents in your facility who, um, you know, you think might be a good fit for this. So there's some details included on this slide. We also have one of our colleagues, Tony Kettner, and her contact information is listed there as well, um, but she really will be the point person for this. So you know, as you read through this, if there's somebody that immediately comes to mind, please reach out to Tony. She's happy to give you more details, next steps. Um, if you have questions about the process, you can certainly um, direct those to her as well. If you're trying to decide whether or not, you know, your story would be a fit for this. The other thing I wanted to mention really briefly before we get started, and you may have seen this come through in some of the e-blast communications from Superior Health, um, but this is related to some scenario-based training. So um, these were released by CMS in August of 2020, both for frontline staff and for management, uh, specifically in the Quality Safety and Education Portal, or QCEP, which you see listed there kind of two thirds down the slide. Um, within these scenario-based trainings, there are 10 different modules on a variety of different topic areas um, from hand hygiene and PPE to surveillance, dementia care, uh, emergency preparedness and emotional health. So really a, a robust sort of set of scenario trainings um, that we would encourage you to pass along to, you know, not only your staff, but other leaders within your facility. Uh, one of the nice things about this training is that there is an option uh, to do it individually, but also to do it as a group. So if this is something that you have, you know, maybe a group of CNAs or nurses who want to kind of huddle together and go through these, um, you know, you can certainly do that. We have included training instructions or I should say link to training instructions, as well as the group information on this slide. Um, and as always, these slides will be available. So, um, you know, you can kind of click through those links and take a look at this in more detail. We also at the bottom of the slide have contact information for Christy. Um, and I see Christy's on the, on the call today too. Um, and she is a great person. If you do have questions or comments, concerns about this, anything you want to know, um, you can certainly reach out to her. We want to make this as easy as possible for you and your staff um, to sort of get through this information. All right, so with that, I will welcome and introduce our speaker for today. And we are joined by Mary Funseth and she will be doing sort of an overview for us on a family perspective of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Mary, do you want me to stop sharing my slides so that you can share yours? I think I'm going to have you, Kelsey, continue to share yours. And then when we get to the video, I will um, walk you through it in case it's not working well for you because I'm very familiar with the little clunkiness of it. Just make sure that you have share sound checked on your options. For okay. Zoom. Okay, so while you're kind of getting ready to do that, uh, I wanna say hello to everybody. Thanks for having me today to share my perspective of the reality that was happening um, at the facility where my mom had lived. Uh, right now, Jerry um, is going to be putting in today's questions in the chat so that you have an opportunity to think about them as we're going through the presentation. And as I, I tell you my story, um, it'll be nice for you to have that opportunity to take a look at those questions to be ready for the uh, point to where we'll discuss this. 
So today, as I mentioned, you know, I want to talk with you all about my perceptions and I will, you know, weave in a few from my uh, neighbors within the facility, my mom's neighbors and their families. Um, as you might imagine, when we couldn't come in, we would definitely talk in the community um, and also support each other. Um, and know that my perceptions, you know, were based on the reality that was before us. And um, that is really part of the story. I'm going to encourage you as it says, to analyze those recommendations from the family and advocates, you know, encourage you to take the time to continue to review all the things that you're doing, because as you know, you're not stopping. COVID is still with us. You still have to do lots of stuff uh, in regards to keeping your staff safe and the residents safe and the community safe. And lastly, you know, taking those recommendations that you hear and not being afraid to adjust things, you know, having ongoing feedback uh, to make those adjustments as needed is so important. Um, and you'll find in my story that that is where we had success. Next slide, please. So first of all, if I had known, and I actually will try not to get too uh, teary-eyed on this, but had I known, and all of you, had known that in early March of 2020, that a policy and an order would come through to start closing the doors of the nursing homes to anyone who wasn't staffed there and that it would last more than a year, I don't think I would have been able to manage, um, but that's our reality. The story today is about a resident who is my mom. She was uh, 92 when she passed, so she was in her 90s. Um, she was in the third and fourth stages of her disease. Um, she had um, pretty significant dementia. Um, I am the daughter in the story, and I was her durable power attorney. And I lived just three minutes from the facility, so it was very hard to see that facility day in and day out. Um, and no, she was in there and I couldn't go in and touch her or talk with her or see her. Um, and so normally I would see her before COVID three to four days per week, sometimes two times a day or three times a day because I live so close by. So I was with her frequently and my mother did know me by name. Sometimes she couldn't quite place me, but she could ask for Mary. She would be looking for Mary quite a bit. Next slide, please. So initially, uh, when all this happened, closure happened. And as you all know, you had to close things down and then you had to figure out how are we going to keep our residents connected to their family, friends, and advocates. So upon our first opportunity, the nursing home did set up a table within a very large, um, I think it was their chapel, uh, commons area. And it was a very long table as it says here, you know, a long 12 foot table. And the experience that we had was my sister and I were allowed in the room. We had to be masked. They then, we sat, we waited. Suddenly they brought in my mother in a wheelchair, which was normal for her. And the staff member has stayed with us. They had to sit at the very end of the table. My mother was masked and again, very confused. She looked across the table, she could see people, and we were trying to be like, hello, mom, it is us, we love you, we try to keep it very simple, but sadly, she looked at the staff member and just simply said, do they like me? And that's all she said, and she said it over and over. She then began to cry, and then we realized it just wasn't going to work, so they had to take her back. And of course, my sister and I left very very, very shook by the situation and very sad, of course, but also know that we are very understanding and we did want to keep my mom safe. And thankfully the activities person that brought her in was someone who frequently spent time with her. So she looked like she had a loving experience. We tried FaceTime. And again, I share these things because my mom had dementia. So the, you know, the opportunities to share with families of their residents who are in the facility, it's not possible for everybody. FaceTime, we tried it once and it was absolutely a disaster. They happened to be nearby my mom. The person said, hey, 
I'm sitting next to your mom right now. Would you like, cause I was talking with them by phone. Can I share her? I'm like, absolutely. And of course I'm just like, oh my gosh, my mom, I can't wait to see her. And sadly, my mom could see my face. She could hear my voice. She recognized it was Mary and she grabbed the screen and she screamed into the, come get me, come get me. We had to, you know, stop the video and interchange. And, and it was devastating for both of us. Um, very, very hard. We had a drop box that people could drop off presents and things, but again, they had to be fully sealed. They had to be brand new and there couldn't be any like baked goods or treats of any kind. And again, we couldn't go in. We could just drop it off of this box. They would pick it up. Initially, they didn't allow flowers. My mother's a huge flower lover. Um, but unfortunately at the time, without enough information, I think people were still being very cautious. They had to not allow flowers, but thankfully, Another time of collaboration, my sister and I, who both happen to be in healthcare, we did some research ourselves and we did call and interact with the person who was in charge of the COVID protocols. And we were able to convince them by Mother's Day to allow flowers back in. So there was really a win-win there. And um, the it was wonderful because the facility chose to collaborate with us. They could have just not talked with us, but they did. And I'm so thankful. And then just as it notes here that nothing could be brought in that wasn't um, prepackaged professionally. Next slide. So now you have a perception of sort of how it felt and just some of those initial pieces, but now I really wanna show you. And so some of you may have seen this and some may not have. I really wanna warn you, um, have some tissues ready. This is, this is a lot. I mean, you're all going through so much and it can trigger a lot for all of you. Um, know that my mom and I will be seen at the end of the video and you'll hear our voices. So Kelsey, if you could turn on the video, please. Yep, give me just a second, Mary, and I'll yep. pull it up. Okay. And know that it will ask you to log into Facebook. You do not have to. You just click back on the picture and more options kind of come up to start it. And you'll even see a line that may say, you don't have access, you do just. <laughs> All right, can you see that okay? Yep. All right. You mute myself and I will share. Kelsey, we lost the video. It was I'm going. Sorry, well. guys. Give me just a second. I'll rewind it here. Yeah, and you don't even really need to rewind. Just go ahead and because we heard it. Okay.
Uh -huh. I know you. Yes, you do. Oh. <laughs> oh, I know you. Yes, you do. <laughs> oh. How are you? I'm really good. Oh, I know you. You've known me all my life. I'm your daughter. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, I love the last line of that when she says, it's a long time since I've seen Mary. Um, that in itself was a huge theme. Um, uh, she frequently still did ask for me. That was a true miracle. And a couple of things I'll say before we move on is that because of this video, they reported to me from the facility that they had four staff members who were rejecting the vaccine back when it was first available. And those four members or the staff saw the video, saw what happened, and they turned around and got the vaccine. So one of the things that I would like to share with you is think about the wonderful stories that you had all of last year and even presently, and what would happen if we have to do it again. Think about creating your own videos and sharing it in the community because once this was put out on Facebook, and I'm very thankful for our New Glarus home in rural uh, south, south Central Wisconsin um, or Southern Wisconsin, uh, that they shared the video because then people started sharing the video and people knew us. And then suddenly we had community members say, you know what, thank you we are going to get that vaccine and we're doing it for you. So um, it was a true miracle and this really was helpful. And I'm hoping it will help all of you as well to have a conversation with your staff and, and use this video. Next slide. So here's really what worked. They had consistent masking. They, they made sure masks were available. So if people came in and said, I don't have one, they had one right away and pleasantly handed that off. It was never, um, uh, there was never any angry anything coming from the facility. They had so much face rooms with many people, as you might imagine. They had um, consistent policies, but as I started off sharing with you, they took feedback. There was many times when a policy was created and it was just something that in our experience with a mom who had dementia, she couldn't follow the policy and the staff couldn't follow the policy. The visitors couldn't follow this policy. So they were willing to step back and make new ones. So it was a ongoing experience. They had plenty of signs. They had plenty of literature. People were educated when they came through that door. They really took a uh, opportunity here to communicate with the community, which was super helpful. It was your all of you are already doing so much and I'm so thankful for those that are continuing to help with that because that was what it really took. Um, next slide. So, and this is again, my message, do not hide any needs of the facility. Talk to the families, let us know the struggles that are happening. Let us know if you have staff that's struggling, staff maybe are sick, we are all in this together. I can tell you ongoing, my mom sadly has passed. However, I still now can go back to that facility and help support them as a volunteer because I know what they're going through and they do need it. I do really encourage you to get that staff educated even if they're turning away and please offer it beyond the staff to their, their families and also the families and residents that come in. Keep doing that, it is working. Um, but please also take a look at the families that don't want to comply with the policy, policies that you have. Um, there, It was very scary sometimes coming in and finding people not 
following through. So we needed the staff, unfortunately, to, to get in there and educate and or say, please leave. And then lastly, the consideration for you need to really look thoroughly at how are you handling the residents' uh, days and visits and everything. The accommodations really need to happen for the folks who have dementia. Um, there was absolutely no way my mom could comply. Next slide. So let's move to the questions. So today's discussion is centering around this, and we'd like to hear from you. We really do, because this is your this is really a good opportunity to share. But what changes did you see in your facility as a result of the visitors' restrictions? And this would be something that I, Kelsey, do people open up their mics for this or do they chat it in? Either works. Feel free okay. up to unmute yourselves and share verbally, and the chat box is always open as well. And you may have something for the other questions too. Um, you know, thinking about you, you had plenty of barriers, I'm sure. Um, you know, and and what of those barriers did you turn into success? And then again, if you would rather answer the last one, you know, if you could change one thing, what would you have done differently? So there's lots of folks on the call and I'm, I'm assuming that you're all thinking, um, but you know, pick it apart piece by piece. Um, what were some of those barriers that you may have had in your facility during last year and also now? Uh, the facility my mom was in, unfortunately they reopened and then they had to close again for a couple of weeks, reopen and then close a couple of weeks. I can tell you that was pretty hard. Um, I was actually in the building one day when they came around and said, everybody get out. And that in itself was hard. Yep, this is Deborah Meyer. Um, you know, as far as changes and, you know, way this, I don't know, this may seem awful, but because, because of, having lack of staff we had to cut mm -hmm. back our admissions so we actually had less residents in the building mm -hmm. and for our dementia people that actually improved their behaviors because it was quieter yep. in there they were able to wander without uh, you know without a lot of without a crowd and and left you know it was different for them whereas our alert you know, our alert residents had a harder time because of not being able to see the families. Yep. So, so um, yeah, we probably saw more more issues with our alert ones missing those daily visits with those families versus mm -hmm. where our dementias people it got to be a quieter unit. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, we saw less falls. And you know, it kind of just makes us look at it, and and we have a lot of double rooms. So as we're increasing getting staff and increasing our senses again we're finding we're getting the the um increased agitation and mm -hmm. and increased falls with our dementia people so it's you know it's kind of um looking at what is a good number for our facility to really be able to care for residents and make sure they have quality you know, and, and now that the families are coming in too, they've been, the families here were, were just wonderful. They understood what we were going through. It was hard on, hard on everyone, but um, just knowing that we had their support, that they, they knew their loved one was being cared for by us was, you know, was, was just, um, well, helpful for all of us. And, yeah. and then, you know, as we, we just, my, my thought, the way I did it was I just encouraged the family members when we could to sign up to be, um, you know, care, you know, caregivers. Mm -hmm. I said, even if you're just, I mean, we'll, we'll, as long as you sign up for our caregiving program, you can come in. I mean, is it, mm -hmm. is it just to socialize and, and kind of, you know, help making sure, you know, come during meals and stuff. 
I just encouraged it. I said that we're not going to deny it as long as we have our paper signed. <laughs> I mean, that's that in itself is an excellent um, example of a change, you know, a barrier from from having families have to stay out to allowing them to come in. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's yeah, very and, helpful. And, and it is, you know, because, it, you know, just to me, just their spiritual and emotional support is is very much as caregiving as the physical. So so we just we viewed it as that. And mm -hmm you know, and, you know, they picked their time of the days, they, you know, what days of the week they would come in and we were able just to work around, around that. Yeah. So. Deborah, what position do you hold at your facility? I'm the administrator. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I imagine you had to occasionally um, work on the floor yourself. Yep. Yeah. There's a few 24 are. hour, day, 24 hour days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I believe that. Thanks for doing that. I just want to mention that Barb Joyce is sharing that early stages, behaviors, crying, repetitive verbalizations, uh, a barrier was severe restrictions of family and visitors. Change occurred with evaluation of the essential care attendant. Each resident that struggled could have had um, the essential care attendant uh, member education and allowed into the healthcare team, you know, improvement noted. So thanks, Barb. That's you know, it sounds like you also tried something important like that. Um, Stacy here is sharing um, that there was definitely increased depression, malaise, anxiety, increased falls. Families that weren't very involved before the pandemic have become more involved through pandemic, which which then benefits that residents' well-being and care. So I think that is a success. I would agree with you. If I could change the mortality that we saw among residents when the virus hit us, I think we could all give anything to change that outcome. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Anything else from anybody? Anyone want to open up their mic? It's it's a hard conversation to have. Um, it's it's hard. I I am actually a social worker. I didn't mention that earlier, but I will tell you now. And um, I happened to be the social worker at that nursing home uh, 17 years ago for 10 years. So I was not unfamiliar uh, with their facility and they weren't unfamiliar with me. Um, so there was times when I was, I kind of jumped into social worker mode and sometimes I, and, and most of the time I was daughter mode, but it was very hard to sometimes to figure out between the two because I knew more than maybe some of the other resident families. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. And Mary, thank you, as always, for bringing your personal story to this. I think, you know, we hear about it, we live it, we see it. But when you can sort of put that emotion with what we're dealing with, I think that really helps to kind of reframe it and put it in a different light. Um, thank you everyone who's on the call. Yes. And I do see Stop that Jerry way. put the link in chat to the survey, the event evaluation. If you could just take a minute to complete that before you log off, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and then just a heads up for next week. So this will be our part two session on motivational interviewing. As a reminder, if you have questions or things that we can use in this sort of role play, please send them to us um, and we're happy to use them. We will not call you out by name, but it's just helpful to use some of those sort of real life scenarios and give you a, some practical tidbits on how you can sort of reframe that conversation. So with that, Mary, thank you so much. Uh, we will close our call for today and we will see you all back next week.